Okay, so you got root three over two and one over two as your side lengths for that 60 degree triangle. If you look at your 45 degree triangle, the two legs have to be the same. Because it's a 45 degree, that means the other angle would also be 45 degree, right, to add up to 180. Meaning that that special triangle in the middle is actually an isosceles triangle. Isosceles, hey, pretty good. <laughs> Meaning that two sides are the same. So the only way that could happen is if this is root two over two, and this is root two over two. Just the sides of the triangle. That would give you a 45 degree if the hypotenuse is one. So that's all assuming that the hypotenuse values are one on this. Thing. Third one, the 30 degree triangle. Um, the 30 degree triangle is actually the same as the 60 degree triangle, but just looking at it from a different perspective. So if you think about your triangle, if the 60 degree is in the bottom left, like going up, the other angle would be what? It would be 30 degrees, right? Because all triangles have to add up to 180. So that means this is actually the same triangle, but just the other way. So the side lengths are the same as the 60 degree, just the other way. So that means this over here is one half, and this is root three over two. Cool, those are our special triangles. Um, you could build all those and prove it with Sokotoa and uh, Pythagorean theorem and that jazz, but we're not going to sweat it. We're just going to have those three special triangles. Cool. Mm -hmm. Which one, sorry? Yeah, so that's like how you can prove special triangles because if it's 60, 60, 60, you could cut it in half. And like that's what I'm saying. I'm not going to go through the proof of why these triangles actually work out the way they work out. You're going to blindly trust me. That those are the side lengths on those triangles. Awesome. We're going to take those triangles and we're going to put them on something called the unit circle. So essentially, we're going to graph those triangles. We're going to put them on a Cartesian plane. Someone might shut that door. Like, <laughs> that was. That's scary. <laughs> As me and the loader burying the truck. <laughs> okay. Um, you guys did not do unit circle last year. Some did, some didn't. I believe one of the classes didn't, and I said, ha, ha, I'm not going to teach you unit circle. That's your math 3 one teacher's problem. And then you're like, <laughs> ah, I came to bite you. Hey, that's bad karma. Uh, so what the unit circle is, is it's on the Cartesian plane. It's called a unit circle because the radius is one unit. Radius R equals one. So this entire circle is built off of a radius of just one. You'll notice that there's lots of angles there labeled for you. Right, so if you look at that thing, they go all the way from zero, and they go all the way around to 360, and they have all those different angles that you're going to have to need to know. Really, it's just those three special triangles built in four different places. But it's the same three triangles over and over and over again. Okay? If we look at quadrant one, and you look at the 30-degree angle, the 30-degree angle looks like this. That's my 30 degree angle. I could make a triangle out of that. So if I went straight down and straight over, there is my special triangle, my 30 degree special triangle. We're good with that? That means I know those side lengths because I know my special triangle. My side lengths for a 30 degree triangle are 1 over 2 and root 3 over 2. 
you might not want to now uh, it's just gonna get a little messy in your notes we'll do the first one like this and then the other ones you probably won't have space to write it nicely we see that cool okay that means that this point out here which we called last last year, mathematics one, like a terminal point. It's the end point on a line. We actually know that point's location. We know it's X, Y coordinates. That point would have an X value of root three over two and a Y value of one half. So like this is a special point on our unit circle where we actually know the coordinates. It's root three over two comma, one half. Those coordinates come from the side lengths of the special triangle that we just built. That's why they are what they are. Before I move on and start adding triangles, are there any questions about that one? Because it's going to be important that you like know what the heck I'm talking about here. Just a reminder, makers, that there is Panicle Pizza available for sale in the canteen today. Panicle Pizza for lunch. It's in the middle of every video. I just like, <laughs> get your Panicle Pizza. <laughs> they should be, I should be charging them like some sort of commercial rate. <laughs> Free advertisement. <laughs> right? Are we okay with that? So we see the triangle red. Angle 30 degree, side lengths. We see how the side lengths connect to a point. Cool, okay. Next triangle. So if you look, they now have an angle out here. This one is gonna get messy, so I don't know if you wanna write all these triangles. If I drew that out to that point on the unit circle, and I went down and over, this creates another special triangle. That green one is the 45 degree triangle. And I know the side lengths of that triangle. The side lengths of a 45 degree triangle are root two over two and root two over two. Therefore, that point is root two over two, root two over two. It's a point on the unit circle. If you went to 60 degrees, I get the same idea. I get another special triangle. This is my 60 degree special triangle. Meaning that I know that point out there as well. That point would be the same point as my 30 degree triangle, but reversed, right? Because it's now 60 instead of 30. So it'd be one over two, root three over two. We see our three special triangles. Cool. There's a lot more points on this unit circle that we need to know. But they're really just those three points in different quadrants. So if you took those exact same three triangles and you built them somewhere else, you would get three more points. But they're very similar. So for instance, let's go and build our triangle in quadrant two. The 30 degree triangle would go here. The 30 degrees is talking about the reference angle. Reference angle means to the closest X axis, right? Throw back to trig 20-1.
Okay, that means I know that point over there. It's going to be the same one as this. This 30 degree triangle, which is root 3 over 2, comma 1 over 2. It's going to be the exact same distances because it's the exact same triangle just built the other direction. The only difference is that it's not going to be positive root 3 over 2. Because I went left, the x value has to be negative root 3 over 2. And then positive 1 over 2. Because I went left and then up to build this triangle. Before I build the next two, are we okay with seeing that the 30 degree triangle is over there? Awesome. Notice that they did not call that angle 30 degrees. I called it 30 degrees. They called it 150 degrees. The reason they called it 150 degrees is because that's called your standard position angle. That's from here all the way to there. So we did that a lot in 20 one. We would go from the positive x-axis, counterclockwise, 150 degrees, which created a 30-degree reference angle. Perfect. Let's build our next one. So in green here, this would be my 45-degree special triangle. Notice that they called it 135 because that's the standard position. This point is at root 2 over 2, root 2 over 2. But because it went left, it's negative root 2 over 2 as my x value. And then I can build my purple one as well. That gives me a 60 degree reference angle it went to the left therefore it's negative 1 over 2 root 3 over 2 that's this point right here I guess I didn't label it there we go Feeling good? It's negative because it went left. All right? Why values are positive? Because it still went up. Left and up would be negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive. Cool. If I went down into quadrant three, what would I know about these points? They're both negatives because I'm down in quadrant three. I went left and then down. Therefore, they both must be negative. My points create those triangles. So the first one would be 30 degree triangle, which is negative root 3 over 2, comma, negative 1 half. My middle one is going to be my 45 degree triangle, which is negative root 2 over 2, negative root 2 over 2. And the third one is my 60 degree triangle in quadrant 3, which would be negative 1 half, negative root 3 over 2. Yeah? Where's the 225 one? It's negative root 2 over 2, negative 2 over 2. What over? Because that would be negative root 3 over 2. That's my 45 degree triangle there. Yeah. And my 45 degree special triangle is root 2 over 2, root 2 over 2. Yeah, yeah, it is. Was it? Did I put that wrong? No. The 45 was root 3. That's all good. Okay, if you built these in quadrant 4, which value is positive, which value is negative? Bingo. X is positive because I went to the right. Y is negative because I went down. But it's the same three points because it's the same three triangles being built. So the one closest to the x-axis is my 30 degree. 
So that's going to be root 3 over 2. And then negative 1 half because I went down. This one is going to be root 2 over 2. And then negative root 2 over 2 because I went down. And this one over there is negative, or sorry, 1 half and then negative root 3 over 2. It's the same points in every quadrant. The only thing changing is your positives and negatives. Perfect. There's four special points on this triangle that we haven't talked about, or actually on this circle, not triangle. Those four special points are if you are on the X and Y axes. So if you look, let's do in orange, there's a point there at zero degrees. There's a point here at 90 degrees, a point here at 180 degrees, and a point straight down at 270 degrees. It's all my X and Y intercepts, essentially. And I do know where all of those points are. If I was at zero degrees, this first one, what is the coordinate of that point and why? Uh, it would be 1, 0. 1, comma, 0. Why is it 1, comma, 0? Exactly, because your radius is 1. The distance from the middle of this circle to the outside of the circle is 1. So if I went straight from the middle, straight to the right, that is one unit. I did not go up or down, so it's one comma zero. If I went straight up at 90 degrees, that would be zero comma one, because I didn't go left or right, and I went straight up one. If I go to the left, that's negative one comma zero. Distance is one, but it went left, so it's negative. And if I look down here at 270, that would be 0, comma, negative 1 because it went straight down 1. That is all the points on the unit circle that you will have to know. We'll build one tomorrow. I'll give you a blank one. We'll build it together, and I'll show you some tricks to building it. I really, really, really like if you just know the logic behind building it, which is those three triangles just being moved around. But the tricks are very handy. So when you get to the test, it's nice just to have the trick to build the trick, build the circle. So I'll show you that tomorrow. I'll give you a big copy that you can build it and then keep it for yourself for your notes. Yeah. Is it ever a question on like an exam to just build a unit circle? No. But you will use the unit circle to answer lots of questions, um, which is I think what we're going to do right now. Let's make computer freezes, and then we're not going to do nothing. Ah, oh, there we go. So we're going to do a bunch of unit circle questions. Um, if the point root 6 over 8, comma, root 9 over B is on the unit circle, determine the value of A plus B. All right, they're telling you that X is root 6 over 8. If you looked at your unit circle, is there anywhere that you see root 6 over 8? No. So you're not actually going to use the diagram of your unit circle here. However, when they said is on the unit circle, they gave you a very, very important piece of information. Yeah, they told you that the radius equals 1. Which means... If you turn this into a triangle, the radius is your hypotenuse equals 1. Agreed? We would do these things last year. I think the best way to tackle it was to draw it. So if we draw what we know, I 
I've got a point. It's at root 6 over 8, comma, root 9 over B. I'm going to draw that point right here. Sorry, root A over B, yeah. I'm going to pretend that's my point right there. Root 6 over 8. Diane Schaefers, could you come to the office, please? Diane Schaefers, to the office, please. Root A over B. We can turn points into triangles. That's what we spent a lot of last year doing. So you could turn this into a triangle by going straight down, straight over, and then building your hypotenuse. I know that this is my x value, so root 6 over 8. And because it's on the unit circle, the hypotenuse or the radius is 1. My goal is to figure out what value goes there in my triangle, the y value. Are we feeling okay with the setup to that thing? So I took my point, I plotted it, I turned it into a triangle. This will give me that distance of my triangle. I don't know this distance, which is my y value. I do know my hypotenuse because it's on the unit circle. Perfect. If I have a triangle and I need to find one of the sides and I know the other two sides, what strategy should we use? A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Yeah, some of you might have uh, learned or memorized that if you're looking for a leg, you could also use C squared minus B squared equals A squared. They're just rearranging the formula to each their own. Um, both ways will work. So if you're like, oh, yeah, I know that, then do that. If you're just a squared plus b squared and then you want to rearrange, then do that as well. They mean the same thing, right? I gotta stop doing those lame arrows. They don't even look like arrows. Yeah, there we go. When you use Pythagorean theorem, c has to be your hypotenuse. That's the important one. A and B interchange, but C must be your hypotenuse. So that means this is 1 squared minus B squared, which is root 6 over 8 squared equals A squared. One squared is one. Root six divided by eight squared. If you use your calculator to do that, please make sure you put brackets around it or your calculator will screw it up. Uh, and then hit math frac. If you want to do it by hand, the square comes in. So the square would go to the root and cancel out with the root. And then the square would also go to the eight, making it six over 64 which if you math fract it using your calculator will be three over 32. Those are equivalent fractions. Equals a squared. You put that in your calculator, you go one minus six over 64, it gives you a decimal, you hit math, you hit frac, and it should give you 30 through 29 over 32. equals a squared. And then what's your last step for Pythagorean theorem? You square root both sides. When you square root a fraction, you square root the top and you square root the bottom. Yeah, we're just not there yet. Yeah. So you square root both sides you get the square root of 29 
over the square root of 32 equals a. Which is correct, but not the correct answer. That is the proper distance. So if you put that into here, you would be correct. However, they said that that distance can be written like this, root A over B. That means there should be no radical on the bottom. That's called rationalizing your denominator. It's taking a fraction and getting rid of that radical in the bottom. You would have done this a lot in the first unit of Math 20-1. So you had to get rid of root signs from the bottom. To do that, you multiply by whatever the radical is. So if I have root 32 on the bottom, then I need to multiply by root 32 to the top and to the bottom. Like that. Now, when you do that, Mr. Blinkhorn's a smart man. We were talking about this stuff. You have to put a fraction bar in between them. So you have to have root 32 divided by root 32 being multiplied. Okay, you've got to put that bar. The reason you have to put that bar is what we're actually doing is we're multiplying by 1. Root 32 divided by 30, root 32 is 1. But you have to show that. Ah, I don't know. Picky people. They said on the diploma, you got to show it. Okay, on the top, you do 32 times 29. What is 32 times 29? 928, perfect. And in the denominator, you would do 32 times 32, which is just 32 squared. The square root of 32 squared would cancel out. And it's just 32. Right? If I took the square root of 32 times the square root of 32, that's the square root of 32 squared. Squared and 30, the roots I would cancel out. I think probably most people caught on that if you have two radicals that are the same, it cancels out. Awesome. That is still not the right answer. It still equals A. We did get the root sign off the bottom, which is awesome, but it's not the correct solution because it's not in simplest terms. So you need to reduce that thing. To reduce it, you need to simplify the radical 928. I'll do this on the side because it's been a while since we've simplified radicals. So you have square root... 928. You need to break this into two different radicals. It's got to be two numbers that multiply together to be 928. The numbers have to be very specific numbers. You need to find a perfect square number that divides into 928. So perfect square numbers are like 4, because I can square root 4. 9, because I can square root 9. Right, we used to build a little chart. It would be like 2 squared is 4. 3 squared is 9. Remember that chart? And your job is to find the biggest number on that chart that would divide into this thing. The biggest number you're going to get I don't know, 64? 64 goes in? Is there a bigger one? 16 works? Makes sense because 16 goes into 32. So you should go 16. And what's the other one? Thank you. I know. Actually, I should because 32 divided by 16 is 2. 2 times 29 is 58. Should know that. I took 928, I broke it up. This is my perfect square number. 
This is not. That's fine. The reason we did this was because the square root of 16 can actually be evaluated. The square root of 16 is 4. Square root of 58 stays 58. So this simplified to be 4 root 58. So I go back to my question. This is 4 root 58 divided by 32. And now we can simplify this fraction because we have two coefficients and those coefficients can both divide by four. Four divided by four is one, so it's just root 58. Notice that I didn't divide the radicand by four, just the coefficient. And then 32 divided by 4 is 8. The distance on that triangle is root 58 over 8. That's a lot to unpack. That does look like what they told me it would look like. They said it would be root A over B. I do have that now. I have root A over B. The answer that goes in here is the value of A plus the value of B. That means my answer is 58 plus 8. The answer is 66. There's a lot there. That should be all skills that you learned last year. I understand it's been a long time though. Right? So there's a lot to be like, oh gosh, I need to remember how to do that. I see people looking at that with like faces of like, oh. Anybody want to ask a question on where your number came from, why I did what I did? No? Yeah? For the 928, you're just finding the highest number it can divide by? The highest perfect square number that it can divide by. So it is specific numbers I'm picking. Um, there's likely a bigger number that goes into it but not a bigger perfect square number that goes into it. All right. Looking at that. Another skill we learned last year was that you can actually build most triangles in more than one quadrant, right? So for instance, I could have taken this same triangle and hypothetically, I could have put that in quadrant four and it still would have fit all the same information that I knew. Right? Like if I drew it like this, you don't need to worry about drawing it, but hypothetically, I could have drawn that triangle with a radius of one down here. And it still would have had the same X value, and I still wouldn't have known the Y value. Right? Like this thing could have a hypotenuse of 1, and it could have had an X value of root 6 over 8. And I still could have not known the Y value. That's the same triangle, but in a different location. Hypotenuse of 1, X value root 6 over 8. The bottom is 1, x value root 6 over 8. Both of them have an unknown y value. Right? They both are unknown. That's what we spent a lot of time last year doing as well. We would take questions. We would build them in two spots. Yeah. 
The answer doesn't say that it's negative, which is why we were able to put it up here, right? Like in the quadrant one instead of quadrant four. But it's also pretty up for interpretation because they didn't say that B and A couldn't be negative numbers, right? So you could have technically had a negative value in there. Yeah, the only B you shouldn't ever have a root A, agreed. And you really shouldn't have a negative on the bottom either. But that's why it's kind of like loosey-goosey up for interpretation on that question. In the future, they will clearly define which quadrant you're in because of this conundrum. Like because of the fact that you could put triangles in more than one spot, and it still technically would work. To know where you build your triangle, you need to be confident with what's positive in which quadrant. So I'm gonna talk about that for a minute. If you're in quadrant one, this is quadrant one, this has a positive X and a positive Y. If you go to quadrant two, this is quadrant two over here, you would have a negative X and a positive Y. If you go down into quadrant three, that would have negative X values, negative Y values. And if you go to quadrant four, that would have positive X values because it went to the right and then negative Y values because it went down. Perfect. Um, most people forget the quadrant numbers, so I figured it was probably good to draw it on there. You start in the top right, and you go counterclockwise. All right, so this is one. Counterclockwise. Beautiful. There's something called the cast rule there. I'll talk about that in a minute. We'll actually come back to it. Um, I really don't even use the cast rule very often. I don't like it. Okay, let's go to here. Determine the exact value of things. So determine the exact value of the following trigonomic expressions. All, I, oh, I hate making statements like everything's going to be like this. A lot of what we do is actually still just Sokotoa. So you throw back way to like math 10 and you learn Sokotoa, which gave you these three ratios. Sine equals opposite over hypotenuse. And last year, we actually adjusted that. Instead of calling it opposite over hypotenuse, we said it was the y value over the r value. Because when you were on a triangle, the opposite was actually the y value. And the hypotenuse was the r value. Cos is adjacent over hypotenuse, but when you talk about it on a Cartesian plane, the adjacent is always the x value, and the hypotenuse is always the r value. And then the third one for Sokotoa is tangent, which is opposite over adjacent in Sokotoa, but when we applied it to triangles on a Cartesian plane, we realized opposite was always y, Adjacent was always x. And we have those three ratios for Sokotoa. We're still going to apply those ratios to these questions. It's just the unit circle makes it very, very, very convenient. So convenient that you actually will just ignore Sokoto for the most part and just no answers without having to do any actual math. Yay, right? Okay, let's look at sine of pi over 6. Pi over 6 is a radian measurement. That is not an angle measurement. Yesterday, we converted radians to degrees. And we found that pi over 6 was the same thing as saying 180 divided by 6, right? Breaking it up into 6 pieces. Which means pi over 6 is really just 
30 degrees. This is the same thing as saying sine of 30 degrees. Agreed, pi over 6, 30 degrees, same thing. Okay, to calculate the sine of something, using SOHCAHTOA, sine of 30 would equal the y value divided by the r value. Thirty degrees is one of our special triangles, meaning it's on our unit circle. So if you look at your unit circle, thirty degrees is this point right here. So I need to do my y value, which is 1 over 2, and divide it by the r value of the unit circle, which is dividing by 1, because the r value is always 1 on the unit circle. This thing is sine of 30 equals y, which is 1 half, divided by r, which is 1. That's from the unit circle. What happens if you take anything and divide it by one? Same thing, right? A million divided by one? A million. Right? Point 0.1 divided by one is point 0.1. So a half divided by one is a half. The sine of 30 degrees is one half. That's the long way about doing that question. Yeah. What was I doing on the side? I was showing you that pi over 6 is 30 degrees. So yesterday we did, uh, because pi is 180. So right here, remember that's 180 degrees, which is also pi radians. You can't see anything? Okay. It'll pop up in a second. Um, 180 degrees and pi are the same value, which is what we were doing yesterday a lot of. So if I have pi over 6, that means I have 180 over 6. And 180 over 6 is 30. We'll actually put radian measurements on our unit circle as well so that you could actually just look at it and see pi over 6. Okay, well, that does it for the video if you're watching.